Everybody, welcome back to the Beyond the Peloton podcast. I'm here, as always, with Andrew Vons from the Choose the Hard Way podcast. We are talking about the Tour of Flanders, my favorite race of the year, coming up this Sunday. Andrew, before we get into it, do you want to say a quick word about your podcast, Choose the Hard Way? Yeah, Choose the Hard Way is a podcast about how hard things build stronger humans, stronger humans who have more fun doing those hard things. Spencer and I just recorded a back-to-back episode with Kristen Faulkner. It's going to be dropping next Wednesday. We'll have the Behind the Music Life and Times over on Choose the Hard Way, and then we're going to be talking with Kristen in depth about pro cycling here on Beyond the Peloton. So don't miss it. You can find Choose the Hard Way everywhere you listen and at choosethehardway.com and at Hardway Pod on the social media. Check it out. Yeah, I'm pumped Pumped to release that one. That was an interesting conversation. And I think I mentioned it to Kristen in the episode. It's been two years since she's been on, and that seems criminal that time can pass that fast. I feel like that was just yesterday. So it's fun to check in with her and see how things have changed. Since we've recorded last, I believe E3 happened. We did not record. Uh, we recorded last Thursday. So while Van Aert wins E3 in pretty, pretty impressive fashion, I thought being the weakest rider in that front group and then just kind of waxing... Pogacar and Vanderpool in the sprint. Gent Wevelgem, Van Art looked even better. So that was three days later on Sunday. Gets away with his teammate Christophe Laporte, gives away the win, which we can talk about if that's lame or not lame. And then Dwarves Dorf, Dwarves Dorf Landerin midweek, Christophe Laporte wins again. So now Christophe Laporte, I think, is the most, this is a very American word, winningest rider on the most winningest classic team so far this season, or winningest classic rider on the most winningest classic team. Going into Tour of Flanders um, sets up a situation where Laporte could win, would get Wevel Gim, Dwarves, and Flanders. And then Van Aert's like, wait, why did I gift that race? That wasn't very smart. I should have just won the race when I could have. But before we get into that, who, who's your favorite for this upcoming Tour of Flanders? We have Tadej Pogacar, Matthew Van Der Poel, Wout Van Aert. I think three, the three best riders in the world are going for it. So that's very cool, very unique. I'm very excited for it. I'm going to stay on script here. Wout will win the Tour of Flanders. And you? Yeah. I mean, I guess full disclosure, I have bet on Wout because I was shocked. He was the third in the betting markets. He's the third favorite, which is surprising to me because at E3, I thought that was a pretty impressive win. He clearly was not at full fitness yet. He is still nine days between that and Flanders. And we saw it Sunday at Get again. He's only getting stronger. So if he, you know, probably the knock on Wout is sometimes he doesn't race as smart as he should like he's always looked strong same thing with Tade. same things same thing with Vanderpool but I thought he looked so focused and and like really rode E3 in a way like that he made it so that he was the only rider that could have won that race the others didn't really take advantage when they had the chance I I like him a lot it, you could imagine him not winning this though he's never won this race it's probably the most important race to him I think it's the biggest one-day race on the calendar it's the Tour de France of one-day races you could imagine him, I mean, I don't want to say choking, but you could imagine him fumbling this one on the one-yard line and Vanderpool winning. If Vanderpool wins, by the way, he gets three titles, which means he would be tied for the most Tour of Flanders wins in history. So I, I could imagine Vander. I, I'm like, this is a, a, a non-denial denial. I, I like Van Art. I could imagine Vanderpool winning this. I think it's harder for Pogacar. Right now, the song I have in my head is a hit by a duo called Millie Vanilli. Baby, don't forget my number. And the reason I'm thinking about that is I watched a pretty amazing YouTube video that I can't believe I had not found until recently. It was Gregor Brown interviewing Wow Fan Art after the 2020 Tour of Flanders. And Wow learned a lot from that loss. And as he's watching the race, I mean, he comments like, hey, I should have started my sprint from farther out. That's why I lost. And I should have been more patient. <clears throat> and watching what Wout did at E3, and I definitely want to get into that, especially Lubegate, getting his, his chain lube provocatively at 21 and a half kilometers <laughs> to go. I thought that everyone was on a wax chain these days and that you didn't have the need for supplemental lubrication at late stages of the event. Uh, I digress, but I think that what we're seeing is Wout is maturing as a writer and 
he's being highly strategic. He's sitting back. He's not wasting energy in the wrong places at the wrong times, like a raging bull, the way we've seen MVDP do for the past several years. And I think that he, if he stays off the ground, I mean, that's, we talked about this throughout 2022, the ground is undefeated. If he can stay off the ground in this race, I think he's going to win. It's funny you mentioned 2020 because while it goes up against Vanderpool, Wout's probably a better sprinter. I mean, he's a world-class bunch sprinter. You'd think, oh, in small group sprints, he should just wax everybody. He's not, he kind of has a poor record in really small sprints i think it's because he tends to start the sprint too late we've we saw that at cross worlds it's exactly what we saw at the 2020 tour of flanders mm -hmm. i think started it way too late vanderpool beats him what's funny is the next year 2021 casper askren beats matthew vanderpool in a two-up sprint by starting long you know it's like he right. learned from van art's mistake and it looked like on on friday at e3 you know pout started that sprint from like 250 meters out he He's learned from his mistakes. It looks like he's not doing short sprints against Vanderpool anymore. Probably the silver lining of blowing that cross world championships. Um, he's not going to make that same mistake again. It, you know, I do kind of wonder though, you mentioned the lube gate. We should get into that. We'll get into that right after this. But Vanderpool, Raging Bull, kind of just all over the place. He's looked really focused this year. You know, he won Milano San Remo with by holding back and and not, you know, kind of just Matthew C, Matthew Smash, the Poggio, he waited, he attacked at the top. Was he a little too kind of reserved on Friday? Like they had Wout in trouble on, on the Kimmelberg and he just stuck on Pogacar's wheel. Kind of seemed like he was always going for a sprint and then he gets beat in the sprint. Like, should he have been more aggressive at, at that race? I don't know. I can't see a scenario where he ended up winning the race. I think that had he been more aggressive on the Kimmelberg, then he's expending more energy and he's probably losing the race anyway. So maybe he just didn't have the legs. He did the best he could to get to the line. And we've seen that from him a handful of times when you think this is an inevitability that he is going to win the race. And then he just doesn't have it. Doesn't have that spark, that dazzle that we like to see from him. Why didn't they attack Wout when he was getting the chain lube? I have no idea. I'm starting to wonder a bit about the tactical noose of Pog, actually. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> right? not a crazy question to ask. Yeah, it's 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 something I wonder about too. Yeah, and I we kind of got into this when we were discussing San Remo on the previous episode, but I've gone I've gone back into the database and watched some more post race interviews. And the thing that Pog said following San Remo, he said, Hey, in 2022, the mistake we made was I did four attacks on the Poggio, four kind of micro attacks rather than going all in on one attack. But his one attack on the Poggio really just became a sustained lead out for his rivals to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. to, then, to then jump him. So, I, I mean, when you see that happening, uh, and again, easy for me to say when I'm not riding a 7.2 watts per kilo on my couch with my kids, but it it just didn't seem that smart. <laughs> it didn't seem like it was going to work. I mean, the only scenario where that would have worked was if he had ridden everyone off of his wheel while they were climbing at 26 miles per hour when drafting is a huge advantage, right? So everybody behind him is probably saving 30 to 35% of their effort just by sitting on his wheel. And he didn't really create separation from that lead group. So I was that smart? I don't know. No, I, I tend to agree with you where it almost seems impossible. It seemed the way he raced that he was never going to get those guys off his wheel. Maybe he's confused about this, but what people misunderstand about watts per kilo is, let's say Tade Pagacha is doing seven watts per kilo and Matthew Vanderpool is doing seven watts per kilo. Those are not equal, especially in a climb like the Poggio. Like if you're going up a 90% grade, Sure, watts per kilo are, are all that matters, but if it's a slight grade, the watts matter more than the watts per kilo. So Tade Pogacar being lighter than those guys would have to think to drop Ghana, he would have had to have been doing like 0.4 more watts per kilos, which is really hard. Borderline impossible. Yeah, so no way, not a chance in hell. <laughs> yeah, like if those, those guys are on form, it's just not that's not the way the way you're gonna win is exactly how Vanderpool won, not how Pogacar won. Um, Pogacar is great when he's great at like piling on the pressure, you know, if he's stronger than his rivals, we saw this, the 2020 and 2021 tour, 
it looked like the bill kind of came due in 2022 where he wasn't stronger than Jonas. And then it doesn't really seem like he has any moves left. Like it's like a defense in football that can just blitz and they look awesome if they're getting to the quarterback. And if they're not, they're just getting torched and they don't have a way to adjust. It's like he could win this race on Sunday, but he's going to win it by just smashing the, uh, the Potterberg and the old Quermont. He's not going to do it with some sort of tactical sleight of hand. Kind of reminds me of Fabian Cancellara, actually, where if, the, if he was not the strongest rider in the race, he kind of struggled to win at times. I'm not going to touch Cancellara. <laughs> I'm not getting Apparently, into that. We don't, we don't even have to do this because <laughs> someone's done it for us. There's, like, the Belgians are still so mad about him dropping uh, Tom Boonen. There's like a six-part Flemish language documentary. Like, really good. Really well done investigating if he had a motor in his bike when he dropped Boonen. Is so, that available on YouTube or is that on Vimeo or on, in like a subreddit or 8chan chat I think board it's, somewhere? I think it's out on like iTunes. I'll, I'll try to track okay. it down. The only problem is we're okay. just all going to have to learn Flemish to listen to it. AI can auto-translate now, so I'm sure there's some way to put that in chat GPT. There's a lot to talk about here today, Spencer, and I don't want to roll a grenade into the room, but I'll go ahead and do it. I should have done more Googling to find this out, but what's going on with Moscone? Is he like leading oh, an, an man, ultra far right nationalist political party in Italy currently, or what's, what's he doing now? That's a great question, man. Talk about someone that fell off the face of the earth. So 2021 Perry Roubaix, he gets fourth, looks, looks fantastic. This is in addition to being a, kind of a far right racist, uh, cultural figure and he lost paris roubaix because he flatted because they were what he got a he flatted because what were they on were they on tubulars or were they on which tire setup can we blame i think they I may have been on clinchers they were on clinchers and then he got so a spare dumb. bike and it was over inflated do you remember yeah. this yeah it's like so, 120 psi it was like he had a time <laughs> machine to 1989 it looked like he was riding on like bananas like banana peels he was just slipping and sliding all over the road he goes to that's that's a huge mistake by Enios. so i'm actually think maybe that doesn't get enough coverage like how does Enios just biff the psi on their tires going into a famously tire pressure dependent race he goes to astana which is turning into a black hole like this team like think of alexi lucinko really good rider it's been nowhere this year. Um, I think they have this guy, Alexander Fedorov, maybe. He's uh, another Kazakh rider. I think he won U23 Worlds last year, and he's been nowhere this year. Mark Cavendish, nowhere. And Johnny Moscon, I honestly forgot this guy existed until you just said that. I, he DNF'd the Volta Catalunya, was really nowhere at Ogran Camino, and then DNF'd at the, Santa, at the Tour Down Under. So... I don't know. Yeah, maybe he does have political aspirations back in Italy, and he's he's, he's neglecting his training. He's going to follow in Sonny Cabrelli's footsteps. That brief run of Italian near Italian domination at Perry Roubaix there for a minute. <laughs> Man, that's all like a fever dream. That was a weird year. But it's funny you mentioned that about Sonny Cabrelli. For those who don't know, he won Roubaix for like a really good season, really good ride at Roubaix. Retires unfortunately because of a heart heart problem he couldn't keep racing and then he ran as a far right. right figure in italy in a pretty conservative region and got beat like wasn't even close to winning that kind of shows you where cycling is in the in like the modern cultural landscape in italy like not a great sign that someone that good on the bike can't get enough like you could imagine i don't know like patrick mahomes retiring and then running for office in kansas city like he's winning that election like, he's winning the election close. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, I was actually kind of shocked at how literal cultural cachet he seemed to have even after those great results. Yeah. I, my mind is jumping to uh, just generally thinking about there was this run of Italian um, incredible results at Flanders and Roubaix there for a couple of years, right? Like we just had this cluster of Italians having incredible results in the Cabo Classics for a minute. Like the, not the golden age, I guess, I don't know, golden age, whatever you, whatever you want to call the nineties, the bad, the bad ages, but no, the, like, not the recently, bad age, right? Yeah. I'm thinking about bed, like, Betty all. all. Yeah. And they had actually Filippo Pazzato. You kind of think of him as a joke now. You know, he was just kind of this like playboy. He would show up sometimes like 
four minutes before the race started in street clothes with like tons of shopping bags at the team bus and then like quickly change and like jump on his bike and go race. Um, but he had some really good results. I was re- recently rewatching some Flanders where, you know, he was probably the strongest rider in that race. So yeah, Betty all is kind of an odd figure. He won in 2019, really impressive ride. And then he seems so up and down, like really up and down, like to the point where I was even joking, like he, he withdrew from, uh, he's not racing. Cause I guess he's sick, but I'm like, is, is he hung over? Like what's going on here? Like, I don't know if I trust Did Betty all just go on a bender in Bruges with all the beers and, and now he's unavailable to race. Well, I mean, even recently at Strada Bianchi, he had a great ride and then crashed right on he one of the crashed. gravel descents like crashed hard i'm not quite sure what the don't feel like the details of that crash ever really emerged other than if you're downhilling fast on gravel many of you may have had this experience it's difficult to stay upright and you might he hit did something blame and fall it over in classy fashion just on the young american he just said magnus sheffield ran into him but of course that's what you would say if it was your fault right <laughs> i don't know this kid rode into me I, it's not my fault that's for sure well, speaking of Americans, what do you think about Mateo's chances here headed into the uh, Cobble Classics? Um, I think about this specific race of Flanders, probably not yeah. great, only because Vanderpool, Pogacar, and Van Aert probably gobble up. Like that's one of those three. If you, you know, there's probably you could spread your spread your bets out between the three of them and still win money as long as one of the three won probably like a 95% probability one of those three wins. So Mateo is a little squeezed there, but if there's a stalemate, I mean, we saw him get fourth at E3. I thought he was closing in, you know, pretty fast. Like he wasn't, you know, I think he was like 45 seconds back. He wasn't realistically going to catch him, but you know, if that race plays out differently, like he could have been in the mix for a podium. Um, He's looked really strong. I don't, it's kind of hard for me to get a read on what type of rider he is. Like, he won Tour of Oman earlier this year, so I'm like, oh, maybe he's a stage racer. He was really strong in the breaks of the Tour last year. Like, maybe he's a stage hunter. Um, maybe you know, he's a pretty big guy. He's like, maybe he's good for Roubaix, but apparently he's just good at everything. So he can climb well enough to compete at Flanders. He's probably big enough and strong enough and uh, has enough sustained power to do well at Roubaix, too. So I don't necessarily see him, like, winning Flanders or Roubaix this year, but these, like, little shoulder classics or a race like Amstel Gold, you could actually really see him poaching one of those do you feel like the career of ahead of him at the Cabo classics is akin to the loyal lieutenant like do do you think we're going to see him do a long run of third to fifth places potentially have gestures of getting on that top step of the podium but never reaching it, or do you think one day he could win uh george hincapi co-worker of mine very nice man i think mateo might be more talented and that's crazy because George Hincapi, like hands down the best American classics writer of all time. Right. But Mateo seems, I'm trying to go back to like George's results. I don't think George was getting results like this when he was the age of Mateo, like just yeah, starting out. It seemed like later in his career when he just had a run of near misses of yeah, almost I mean, winning, just almost getting winning Roubaix, beat up right? on by, yeah, like almost won Roubaix multiple times, just getting beat up on by uh, like the quick step, uh, forerunner i think he also had the misfortune he had like tom boonin as a teammate and then boonin was like immediately better at 21 years old but then left for quick step right um but the fact that mateo is so george did win a tour de france stage like later in life though from a breakaway i don't know if he was ever as talented as a climber and you know, like maybe pure power that mateo jorgensen is so i could see him and george did win Gent wevelgem so if you kind of close your eyes and imagine at the end of his career Mateo has four monument podiums and a Gent Wevelgem win. That's not disappointing. And, you know, that's, that maybe is realistic, but I, I kind of, I tend to think he has a better chance of winning one of these big, big monuments, if not only because he's, he's more versatile, like he could win. Um, I don't know, like it sounds crazy, but like Lombardia, like he's such a good climber that he's almost a contender at every single monument. Whereas George was more just Flanders and Roubaix. Yeah. And as we take a look at some of the other riders who might animate the race on Sunday, I'm thinking about 
some of the crashes we had in the past week at E3 and Ghent, specifically <clears throat> Benium and Dylan. Do you think that those crashes are going to impact those guys heading into this race, or do you think they have the potential to animate it? Um, so Benium Gurmai, I guess I would say no. Apparently, he came out and said he's not as fit as he was last year. Okay. And Flanders is the type of race where it's the results you've been having in these smaller classics are very predictive of how you'll do in the actual event. You rarely see someone, I think Betty all might be the only example in recent years where you're not just like obviously one of the strongest riders in the, in these races, like it's, it just finds you out. You have to be in the best form of the year to be able to win this race. So I think Benny Grimai not going to win Dylan Van Barrow. I liked a lot. Um, and then he crashed at E3 and then apparently now he's not starting Flanders because he's injured. That's a huge, so obviously he's probably not going to win if he's not starting, but huge loss for Yumbo. I mean, he yeah. was, if you think of Yumbo having, they have a strong team, but as when Murphy, when we had Benji on saying how many of these guys can realistically get over those last two climbs with Pogacar, I would have said, uh, Van Barl and then maybe Laporte are the only two outside of Van Art on that team that can do that. And now they're down one of them. And what of Pidcock? Do you feel he has a shot at actually winning? Is he a decoy? Like what happens over there on Ineos? Well, he had a concussion. So that's never good. It, especially yeah, going off what I just isn't. said, where you it finds you out. You can't be lacking. But he did get at Dwarves during the week, he did get 11th and he was in the group 15 seconds back from Christophe Laporte. So that's the positive. The negative is he was never really a factor. He, he was in the peloton that then caught the group that was kind of dangling 20 seconds off the front. And then the, the sprint for second place was won by a Spanish rider who has no past results in the classics and was off the front since the early breakaway. So the fact that that guy had more than Pickock had in the tank left at the end of the race probably doesn't speak well for Pidcock being able to stay with these main guys when they get to these climbs. Part of what I've loved about the 2023 season so far is that you can get several hours of high quality viewing out of most of these races. It's no longer the case that you need to just tune in for the final 20 or 30 K at some of these semi classics. And I was looking back at 2019 Flanders last night and if you listen to our Kristen Faulkner interviews when they drop next Wednesday, you will learn that uh, my family are currently turning into zombies. They have some severe illness. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty nuts situation, but there hasn't been much sleep. Everyone's incredibly ill. Somehow, um, I think because of uh, my CTL currently, I think that I'm uh, just getting hit by this a little bit less than the family. But yeah, so I was up last night, I'm watching 2019 Flanders and the action started 90K out, 80K out. It was incredible to watch what was going on in the race. Also, just to see people using the puppy paws position, getting in like the full tuck. I forget what that's even called now. The thing where they sit on the top tube, the super tuck. Uh, Mate Mahoric, of course, attacking like 60K out in the super tuck and pedaling like what have we <laughs> what have we done to professional cycling i feel like we've castrated it and just taken away some of these incredible things that just made it so visually interesting to watch it is a bummer that they don't i, I wish they just allowed i guess it's dangerous which is why they don't do it but cycling is kind of dangerous <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah point, just don't just don't do the race that would be, actually be the safer option but it's funny you mention that because up until 2017, there was a real structured view of like, well, you cannot attack until the second climb of the Quermont and maybe even the Paderberg. Like, it's just too hard. The race is too hard. In 2017, Philippe Chaubert goes on the, he goes like 90K out on, I think it was the, the Mou de Grammont, which is used to be the climb closest to the finish. And it, people were like, oh, they, they included it in the race, but it's just a ceremonial thing. It's too far for anyone to go. Philippe Gilbert attacks with 90K to go and then stays away and wins the race. That was a fantastic. If you're going to rewatch one, go back to 2017. That was really fun. And then you had the crash um, when Sagan rode into the, the sweater on the barriers. Um, and then after that, it was like 
Riders like, oh, wait, I can go further out. So then we've seen these attacks start to go further and further out, probably ketones and fueling and just being smarter about, you know, you think you mentioned yesterday during our Faulkner interview that like you can metabolize 120 grams of carbohydrates in an hour. That probably has really contributed to this attacking further and further out that, well, if, if it's at an hour and 45 minute move, you know, it's just a little equation. Like you just have to take in this much fuel and you'll be able to sustain that move. So that's, I think 2017 was a big moment in making Flanders, especially this new course, which lacked a little bit. It was a little formulaic until 2017. And now it's like, yeah, these attacks, when are they going to come? Like, is Taddy going to go 100K from the finish? It's not crazy. He, he might. Yeah, I'm just looking through the start roster and I'm thinking about who some of the <clears throat> who might have a, a puncher's chance of animating this race in a really unexpected way. And there are some gosh, there's so many different people who potentially could do that. Like who's top of mind for you? Do you think Stefan Kung, for example, could end up animating this race? I mean, Kung, I love Kung for like third through fifth place. Yeah, I do. Such a cool last name as well. Yeah. Doesn't, I wish Ghana was in this race because obviously, like, if he had his climbing form from San Remo, he, anything's possible. Um, Nielsen Palace is really strong. I tend to think, though, that it's going to be Tade or Matthew. I, 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 I don't think that, that the firepower is there. Like, even someone like Matty Motorich, who's a really good rider. Like he's not gonna go and put anyone in a bind. Like Vanderpool, Van Art, and Pogacar will just follow him. And like Pogacar is gonna be down to follow anyone. And if Pogacar follows them, Van Art and Vanderpool have to go. You know, and you know maybe Van Art sends like Laporte with them. But even then, it's like, do you really trust him to get over those final two climbs with Pogacar? Maybe not. So he might have to respond himself. I think we could actually see a thinning of this really, really early. Um, and it just being like the main guys, plus a few riders like Jorgensen, Stefan Kung, Nielsen Palace, like left his hanger on, hanger honors or like Matty Motorich. And then th those guys getting dropped and it just being the lead three or four through the final 12 K Th that's kind of how I see it happening. Yeah. Watching Motorich in the 2019 edition of Flanders, I feel like everyone knows his tricks now. And he doesn't have that next level of talent or genetic ability that we see with, with Wow, with Matthew, with Pog. And I'm starting to wonder, how is that guy going to win a race again? Unless it's the case that the people behind him are just looking at each other, wondering who's going to close this gap. That's, I feel like that's the scenario in which he can win races going forward. There are no more, you know, he doesn't have another dropper post to pull out of the bag of tricks. I don't see him just riding away from a group where do you see him winning yeah i mean for guys like that it's always hard to win because he can't sprint and he's not he's not like a breakaway rider like pagachar where you know it's coming and you can't stop it like he just kind of noodles off the front so just starting from that position it's like a tej Manute. tej Manute doesn't win very many races even though he's good because he can't sprint and he's not strong enough to straight up drop you so that's a hard position to start from you're never going to be a prolific winner I think Mahodorich almost has the misfortune of having such a good 2020 and 2021 that then there was this feeling that he's option A at Bahrain. He's, he's a top-tier classics rider. Like, no, he should, he should not be your main option because of the limitations I just outlined. I think where he goes is he either goes to like Yumbo and he's playing like Dylan Van Barl, same thing. Guy, guy can't really sprint. He, he is sometimes strong enough just to straight up drop people, but he needs a little bit of uh, like static going on to get away. And if he does get clear, he can win. I almost think Matt and Motorich needs to, to move teams, you know, get on a team with a big, big star. And that opens up a lot of possibilities for you. Or Bahrain gets a big, big star after Yumbo falls apart in 2024 because they don't have a sponsor. Yeah. Watching him in that 2019 edition and in particular, the body positions that he adapted and the contortions he made of his body to try to be as arrow as possible to get away from the group. I, I just felt like, um, he's like the latter day Adam Hansen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, probably more talent. Than Adam yeah, definitely, Hansen. definitely more talent than Adam Hansen. He's not just going to 22 grand tours in a row or whatever to ride for other people. He's a, he's a game 
writer he wins but i do feel like he's always been on the cutting edge of where writers are headed with body position with equipment he was taco vanderhorn before there was a taco vanderhorn yeah like identifying his physical limitations and then Justin, not only his bike, but like his riding style. Like, do you remember this stage? It was stage seven at the 2021 Tour de France. I'm going to make sure this is right. A long stage, 250K stage. It's like a, a monument stage. And he went far, like far out. And he was in a group with really strong riders like Vanderpool and Van Art, and won because he was just like, no, I'm going to go further. Like, however far you think you can go, I'm going further. And it worked. I mean, it was really smart. As you say, people kind of realize that they can go further than they thought they could in the past. That's kind of hurt his ability, but I think he just needs to get on a, a better team probably. I don't think he he's not a good option A. He needs to be like an option B or C. Um, should we circle back really quick to the Van Art? The, also, I always want to say he does just have some misfortune. Like if you go back to Gent Wevelgem, it's really unfortunate to him that Wout Van Aert, Tadej Pogacar, Matthew Vanderpool just kind of want to win every race. Like in a different era, a guy like Motoric wouldn't have to be competing with the top, top tier guys at every race. You know, and he was probably the strongest person in that chase group at Gemmel yeah. Wevelgem before he crashed. So, you know, maybe he pops off a win like that if the best Grand Tour rider in the world and like the best Grand Tour stage hunter and probably the best classics rider all just decided let's win every race between us. So just some bad luck on his part too. But you go back to E3, Van Art in a little bit of trouble on the Kimmelberg. They don't drop him though. It's kind of clear it's coming to a sprint finish. He drops back to the car to get lube on the chain. And can you give us just like a quick primer on like what the heck chain wax is versus chain lube? Yeah, there are two primary methods you can use to increase the efficiency of your chain and to stop it from making noise. One is to apply a petroleum-based product. The other is to remove all petroleum-based products from your chain using a degreaser, drying it, and then you drop it into something that looks like a crock pot or rice maker that has boiling wax, and you cover your chain in wax, you remove it, and then allegedly you don't have to further lubricate the chain Waxing has become the predominant methodology that teams use because it yields marginal gains. If you go cruise around on the internet and listen to writers and tacticians who are at the cutting edge, they say that a wax chain can save you up to 10 watts. And in this context, that could be a race winning margin. Yeah. And also important to remember, it's like F1. Like what's good for an F1 team is not necessarily good for me driving around. Like, the wax chain is probably great because these guys ride chains for like four or five days max, you know, like they're changing chains all of the time. Like if you're just, I'll ride a chain for, chain for six months and like beat it up, probably chain lube is best. Like I, don't, I just don't believe that a wax and, and the thing I'm a little skeptical about these wax studies and just marginal gain message boards in general, like, are you really testing this through like 260 K's of Flanders rain and gunk and like I understand in a laboratory setting or like if you put it on and go out and do it on a highway outside your house it's I have no doubt it's faster I just wonder like does it really hold up under real real conditions or maybe Van Art was just kind of seeing ghost and thought he was hearing a squeaking and got it was like a mental lubricant like it's not actually helping him and he just thought that he was slower because he'd been riding through wet roads for so long who knows? Apparently it's illegal though, right, Spencer? Well, yeah, this is like kind of in the week <laughs> of, of funny, funny rules. Like I didn't know you couldn't wear a continuous glucose monitor. And then Kristen Faulkner was disqualified from Strada Bianchi for that. I also did not know you could not get a mid-race chain lube. This is like a tradition in cycling. You, all, you always see the mechanic hanging out the window and lubing the chain. One of the reasons I, I think it, they outlawed it is because if you are in a breakaway and you're getting a little dropped or you're struggling, oh no, I need some lube on my chain and your car comes up and the mechanic grabs onto your bike and the car accelerates and pulls you back up to that group. I probably that's why it's outlawed, not because Wout Van Aert's getting like lube on the chain mid race that's giving him like a 20 watt advantage. But you know, maybe, but you could also see like, what if they go through a bunch of mud one mechanic is like cleaning someone's chain while it's moving and the other rider is like, well, that's crazy and dangerous. I'm not doing that. Like they don't probably don't want to incentivize 
teams and riders to take massive unnecessary risks. And now that we're on the topic is I think back on the past three or four years of watching bike racing, I feel like you just don't see some of the in race mechanical adjustments that used to be incredibly frequent. I feel like everybody used to be getting a seat adjustment or you know, yeah. something was going on with the brakes that led to a mechanic leaning out of the car, the rider having a hand on the car or the rider getting pushed by the butt while the mechanic did something for like five minutes. You just don't see that anymore. It's not I, done. That might be, that also might be, I don't know if it's like an anti-lube rule. I think it's like any mechanical adjustment is not allowed on the fly any longer. Doesn't seem like it. And they've definitely, they want those riders out there running dry. And I mean, also it was ridiculous. Like the brakes, they, I guess they've changed brakes. They're all disc brakes now. So you're not going to adjust that on the fly, but inferior technology, it would just be people like hanging onto the team car for 10 minutes while their mechanic pushed them along. So probably good that they've ironed that out. Yeah. Like a Cipollini type move for sure. Yeah. Oh, I need this bottle. I just have to hold on to this bottle for 20 minutes. Just for this entire climb. (laughs) Yeah. And if you remember, this came to a head at, I think it was the Volta Espana where Nibali was dropped in group two. He just grabbed on, he didn't even like fake needy and help. He just grabbed onto the team car and they (laughs) drove him up to the next group. And like, yeah, you're disqualified. Like that's ridiculous. You can't do that. And I think it kind of woke them up to the fact that these team cars are being abused. Also, Damar allegedly won Milano San Remo, I think the year prior, because he held onto a team car for like half the race. Speaking of which, Nibley just completed the Cape Epic. I'm checking on his result. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> yeah, he actually, he was on racing on team Italian friends with Samuel Poro, and they finished in 13th overall, which is pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. Like who's, who's beating them? Who beat them? Some I guess of the wor- current some of the world's yeah, current yeah. professional mountain bike racers. Mountain bikers, yeah. yeah, Christopher Blevins and Matthew Beers ended up winning the race on the last stage, which was outstanding. And we're not going to debate the ethics of this right now. But Mitch Docker and Ian Boswell competed in the amateur division, and there was a Velo News article uh, rationalizing why it was okay for two former world tour writers to uh, compete in the amateur race, which I believe they won by a substantial margin and they, they won most of the stages. I mean, should we, where do we stand on this? I guess technically they are amateurs. If we're just going by the literal rule, sure. They're amateurs. It's a little funny, right? When you have, I mean, I think Docker retired like two months ago, three months ago from professional road racing. Right. And then you're just versus Nibali, who's in the professional race getting 13th. He's also a, an amateur technically. I don't know. I just think that's, odd. I think I find that odd when guys who are former pros, but still really riding at a professional level, are they just smashing amateur riders? It's probably not the spirit of what the category should be. I don't know what the spirit of international mountain bike stage racing is versus the spirit of gravel, but it looks like Mitch and Ian, by all accounts, super nice guys. I really enjoy your content. I also have to believe that you were probably getting more support than a random person who flew to South Africa to go do this race, or maybe not, but they were on team Digger and the Doughboy. They did take first place overall in the amateur race and 32nd overall in the entire event i i am um, they are like two like world-class nice people like love both yeah. ian and mitch and they're getting 32nd i mean i guess that's not their their argument would probably be that we're not training at a professional level and we're the 32nd best team here so therefore we're well within our rights to race in the amateur category maybe it's cool to get beat by them if you're an amateur but or is it disappointing if you flew to South Africa and you're just getting crushed by guys who used to be pro? But that's kind of sometimes the name of the game in, in any type of amateur racing. Yeah, I don't know how that would go down at the bus stop ride or in the semi ride out in SoCal, but you know, so it goes. You're definitely it's definitely group rides in Boulder. Like it, it's it's there's no like you're like Ted King can show up. And Ted King's got to got to wrestle in the mud like everybody else. You know, there's like there's no gifts, but there's also no complaining if a pro just absolutely crushes you. 
I, I wanted to jump back to earlier in the week, and I'm forgetting if this was at E3 or uh, Gantt Wevel Gim. So Spencer, maybe you can help me correct my memory. Which of the races started and took place primarily in pouring rain? Was that Gantt Wevel Gim? That was Gantt Wevel Gim. There okay, was like I'm, I'm sorry, my notes rain in E3. Yeah, my notes are mixed up here. Uh, a note that I had from Gantt Wevel Gim was. Uh, we have seen the prominence of GABA rain jackets since their introduction. That's really been the go-to rain apparel for pro cyclists because it doesn't flap in the wind. It does keep you warm. It doesn't really keep you dry. It has kind of a wetsuit effect. I personally don't love it just for day-to-day riding, but I could see why you would wear it in competition. We're finally getting to the point that this fabric must have been around for a decade for the longest time. All the teams just wore the off-the-shelf GABA rain jacket or like black. rain jersey. Yeah, you can't so, see who they are. Yeah, yeah. I wanted I wanted to like take them to a uh, take them to like Mass Street and Lawrence to get silk screen logos <laughs> on on their uh, on their GABA jackets. Now we're finally starting to see they're doing the jersey silk screen over the GABA. So we're seeing some of that. But I wanted to give a shout out to Intermarche. They're going full on neon yellow rain jackets. I think that this is a very positive move for the sport. Alexi Vermeulen actually also runs a high-vis yellow windbreaker when he's out riding. I know this from his YouTube channel and from having him on Choose the Hard Way. And I feel like previously, the only people that you would see out with that yellow Pearl Izumi windbreaker, it would be like 65 plus uh, riders, riders on tandems, it's awesome. Anybody riding bikes is great, but those tended to be the types of people that you saw with the high visibility jackets. They actually make a ton of sense, I think, for the day-to-day rider. And the trend, of course, has been like all black neo-fascist kits, um, you know, Star Trek looking. <laughs> neo-fascist. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yes, I am, I am too guilty of this trend, but yeah, I also, it does kind of have like a Star Wars New Order, you know, like after yeah. the Empire. You, yeah. I'm it, I'm speaking of that in a fashion sense. It just like it has a a certain aesthetic from a bygone era. But I think it's fantastic to see high vis taking off in inclement weather in the Peloton because it makes a lot of sense for the day to day rider. And you can see them. For that's the what team. I'm. That's what yeah, I'm saying. Like, I know yeah. exactly who they are. Versus, wow, look at all these like Sudal Quickstep and FDJ just kind of have anonymous blue cold weather gear. And I can't tell who the heck they are when they're in the race. Yeah. For the, I, I have become very freaked out about getting hit by a car in recent years, probably just another symptom of becoming old, but I, yeah, I'll wear like a really high vis rain jacket if it's raining. Cause I'm realizing like most car bike accidents happen cause they're not seeing you. And if it's slightly low visibility, and it's raining like people can't see anything so yeah wear high vis it's, it's probably best i think it, most car bike accidents typically happen because somebody saw something awesome on be real pop up while they're driving their car unlike their tesla 45 inch tv <laughs> <laughs> they've got some games in there but while we're on this uh topic of technology spencer what is going on with pro cyclists and their bike computers these days because we're seeing them hit that lap button like i have never seen it before in the history of professional cycling yeah this is a good a good point this might seem like a non sequitur to most but it is all over the place it's actually not it's not crazy to think that flanders could be decided by someone being too distracted by their bike computer that a breakaway gets away and wins the race people cannot stop pressing the lap button if you don't know what we're talking about if you have a bike computer there's on, there's off. It auto starts on. It also also auto starts off if you stop moving. You don't actually really need to press it ever. There's also a lap button that will split out your effort. So if you want to say like, how hard have I gone in this last five minutes? I'll press lap and it will save it. I can look at it later. You can also just clip any of this later at your own leisure at home with software that's been around for like 35 years. It's not hard. So I don't, it, it feels like it's OCD. It's like a little tick that's overtaken the Peloton and people cannot stop pressing the lap button. I think Remco Evenepoel at Catalonia was, was kind of obsessively pressing the lap button. Do you think this is some sort of, are we seeing, and I wanted to mention this earlier with like your outsiders at Flanders, 
like we saw during these classics, the thing that's been crazy to me is just how much better the top, top riders are. Like whenever Van Art, Vanderpool, Pogacar, Laporte want to drop an, the rest of the Peloton that also includes like former world champions like Matt Pedersen, <laughs> they just do it. Like it's not, it, it doesn't, it's like pros being on a local group ride. They're just yeah, like, yeah, it's, an, we, it's nuts. We want to be by ourselves. So if, if the SHIT really goes down at Flanders, I don't think the average rider really is a chance, but we've also seen the same thing with these stage races. Like at Catalonia, whenever Remco wanted to go, one guy could go with them and it was Roglic and they would just drop the rest of the pretty talented field. Like maybe he, it's just so easy for him and it's just a training effort. And he's just like, coach wants me to split out the five minute efforts and that's what he was doing. Or maybe if it's like 45 second efforts, I have to like collate while training so we can look at them later. That would be my best guess that guys are training in races and that's why they're pressing the lap button so much. They're potentially training in races and you're right, Spencer, this next level of talent that we've seen emerge during this golden era of cycling, it's making the rest of the Peloton look like space ball extras at certain moments. Uh, it's almost as if they've been dropped into a field uh, comprised exclusively of riders from the drone hopper team circa 2021 at the zero. <laughs> and it's, it's really crazy just to see them right away effortlessly seemingly. But another thought that I had about the computer thing, because I noticed Vanderpool is also doing it and I haven't seen him do it before in the past. And there's the lap button thing that we saw Remco doing at Catalonia. I'm also curious and we should have asked Kristen Faulkner this. I might shoot her a, a text and ask her, but I'm curious if maybe they're looking at the route or like looking at the gradient. I'm wondering if they're using that potentially rather than what they did in the past where they had huh. the specific climbs called out at specific Ks or maybe their DS is telling them, hey, there's a right turn coming up. It's this climb. It's going to be this. You need to hit this many watts. I don't know what's going on. All I know is that if you're looking at a bike computer and if you're in the controlled chaos of a professional cycling peloton where you have world-class riders like Benjamin Germay riding into a pole because he doesn't know it's coming and actually looking at the 2019 Flanders footage ra last night, remember uh, Matthew Vanderpool had to bunny hop uh, like a traffic island that popped up out of nowhere, ended up flatting, then had all of his spokes broken out. He was looking down at his computer, it looked like, and then landed really heavily on his shoulder and head and because it's professional cycling of course then just got right back on his bike and <laughs> <laughs> and kept racing but it's typically not a, a, a high roi strategy to be looking at your bike computer while you're racing a bike it is very yeah it's like even if you're an amateur cyclist listening to this and you want to get some intervals in i wouldn't recommend lapping like you're just like any focus that's going on the computer is going is coming off your training like you actually shouldn't be messing with the computer that much you're looking at it that's kind of interesting about gradient or maps it's kind of funny it would be i would disagree with it but maybe maybe they are just like what's the gradient should i attack right now is it steep instead of just looking with their eyes at the road and trying to tell if it's steep one thing we're about we're going to get kicked out of our studio here in a few minutes but one thing i want to ask before we go so all like it just seems like the best riders are better than everyone. The best riders are winning every race because they want to win. Some people are complaining about this. You know, we can discuss if it's good or bad. This kind of makes sense to me. Like, doesn't is it isn't it kind of odd that actually the best riders don't win more races? Like you would never be watching professional basketball and like sometimes Giannis is the best, but sometimes this random guy is better than Giannis. Or like Patrick Mahomes is always the best. Like He's just good every week. Is this just cycling becoming more like a, a regular sport where good riders are good and they win across the entire calendar? Like was in my mind that maybe it was kind of weird that they were just winning, like Lance was winning one race a year and then the other times he actually wouldn't be as good as at that race. Yeah. I think science and training have converged at this moment in time and we're seeing generational talents have the ability to have these hot streaks. I think the X factor here, and if you followed any of the Netflix series, the the golf one, Swing Fling or whatever, whatever it was called. <laughs> <Swing> <laughs> it should have been called that. It's a good uh, name. The F1 series, 
I think the X factor here is psychology. And I think it all has to do with the level of confidence of these riders. And I think what's really unique about this moment in time with cycling, it's not just the confluence of training, technology, nutrition, talent. It's that these riders have the mentality to be able to go out there and win consistently. And I think more than anything else, that's what's incredible to me about this moment in time. And I'm loving every minute of it. I wouldn't want it to be any other way. And I'm also cognizant that if you just look at sport in total, maintaining that level of confidence and staying uninjured is not something that can last forever. So this seems like the new norm, but just wait a minute, wait five minutes, wait a month, wait a year, something will change. We'll see a new set of super talents rise up. And if you've been a fan of cyclocross as I have for a long time, this is just the standard, right? Like this is what has happened in cyclocross for the past five, six seasons where you have Wout and Matthew show up and everyone else is cruising yeah, around like space balls like... extras. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. As you say, like Ala Philippe double world champion was really good. And then now just is not as good. Uh, we're not even we're, talking about him. We're not yeah, even guess, talking about him. He almost won Flanders before he rode into that motorcycle. I guess that's what this is. And then like Egan Bernal misses a season because he's injured and is now a scrub. And have we seen is maybe, maybe he's just like too hard. Like if you're out of the, the mix for just a few months, you're just done and you can't compete with those guys anymore. I guess that's what we're seeing. Um, it seems crazy that we'll never see Bernal really contest at the front of the race, up front of a race again, but maybe that's the reality. I think it's very difficult to get the eye of the tiger back once you've had a catastrophic injury, as we've seen with Froome, Bernal. I mean, I want to talk about this in a future episode, but what we haven't talked about it during the past two years is that Wout came back from that horrific wreck in the time trial at the Tour de France. Yeah, yeah I was right? just going to say that. Yeah, like yeah. sliced his leg open like a sausage, sausage casing and kind of didn't seem to really make make a difference at all. No, and that's because he has a very unique psychology and he's a very unique competitor. Like he is a different kind of human being in every regard and with different perfect hair at all times. Oh, yeah. I was uh, like at a grocery store in Hawaii and there's like two hippies in front of me talking and they're like, what are you grateful for, man? Like, I'm grateful for my legs. And it's like, that's like a good, like, like a good, you can't really critique that thought. But I was like, yeah, this is like, whatever, like, get me out of this line. Then I was like, you know what? I'm grateful for Wout, for Vanderpool, for Pagacha. Like the fact that these guys just want to win every race all the time, like that's pretty cool. So I am... I am pumped for Sunday. I'm excited we get to see these guys going head to head to head at I, what I think is the coolest race on the calendar. So no complaints from me, and, I, and I'm pumped to see the race. And we have a double Wout pick. Is that correct? I picked Wout. Are you on the record? Yeah, picking I'm going to pick Wout. Okay. I'm going to put that on paper. All right. And do you have a – who's your wild card? If it's not Wout, who might it be? I mean, this is lame, but Pogacar. I mean, that's like – he's probably the favorite, the bookie's favorite, but he's my wild card. Okay, I like it. I mean, if you want a true wild card, Matteo Jorgensen actually, or Nielsen Palace. Those guys are flying right now. Yeah, I'd go with Nielsen Palace. He's my wild card. I mean, that would be cool. I would, I would burst into just like a ball of atoms if an American rider won this race. Something's coming for that kid. I, I agree. A really, really good year. Kind of under the radar good. But thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for joining us, Andrew. And we'll be, uh, we'll be back next Wednesday with Kristen Faulkner. Let's do it.